So this is the first in the Centre for the History of People, Place and Community seminar series for 2023 to 24, convened by my colleague, Dr. Ruth Slatter, who you can see on screen right here. Um, it's all around the theme of co-producing histories of place. So we have a huge variety of content and many of the seminars are co-hosted with collaborators and partners right across the UK. Really exciting programme. You can find more details on our centre events page or in a post Ruth has written for the IHR blog and I will drop a link into the chat in a little while. Thank you for joining us today. First of all, the usual few bits of housekeeping. So please note, as you'll have seen, I have switched on recording and we are recording this session. So please be aware of that and only speak on camera or appear on camera if you're happy to be included in the recording. You'll see that all attendees have joined uh, muted with your microphone switched off. That's just for general security and to avoid any background noise and interference. Please do leave your camera on if you're happy and if you have the bandwidth to be able to do that as it is lovely to see some faces in the room. So the IHR Centre for the History of People, Place and Community fosters innovative co-produced research into placed histories across all regions and periods from the rural to the urban, from the parish to the metropolis. We're home to projects like the Victoria County History of England, um, a project that's been running since 1899, and then the digital crowdsourced mapping project, Layers of London and many others. The Oxford Centre for Methodism and Church History, our co-host this evening, promotes historic links between Oxford Brookes University and the Methodist Church through archives, artworks, publications and research. We saw some of their activities in a recent publication in the welcome slides. With particular relevance for this evening's seminar, the Oxford Centre has the world's largest collection of art and papers related to James Smetham, which is just one element of a much larger archive of material related to Christian and specifically Methodist history. So this evening's focus, let me just see if I can find muted. So please do keep muted so that we can avoid the view switching. Let's see if I can find who that is. There we go. Um, so this evening's uh, seminar, focuses on a particular project on James Smethen. Since 2019, a team of archivists, creative practitioners, curators and researchers have been exploring the life and work of the little known artist and devoted Methodist James Smethen. Today's seminar is going to introduce James Smethen and his art and provide an overview of how he and his work have been approached during this exciting project paying particular attention to the public engagement events and the broader ethos of knowledge exchange embedded within this project. Today's seminar is going to focus specifically on how co-production methods have resulted in innovative approaches to Smetham's own approach to visually creating and experiencing personal and spiritual place. And this evening's seminar coincides with a free exhibition of Smetham's art at Bewdley Museum, which I'm sure you'll be hearing more about from our speakers this evening. So in a moment, I'm going to introduce our speakers. Ahead of that, I just want to let you know how you can engage with this evening's seminar. So when the time comes, you'll have a variety of options for speaking, making a comment or asking a question. If you're happy to ask your question on camera, you can raise your hand using the Zoom raise hand function. You'll find that at the bottom of the screen or you can just wave and after a while I will spot you the traditional hand waving method. If you would rather not speak on camera, you can drop your question into the chat box and we do invite you to keep the chat box open throughout the seminar just to keep in touch with any comments or information. If you do that, then I can invite you to speak if you want to or I can just read your question from the chat box. Do feel free to comment during the presentation, but save your questions till the end so that I don't miss them in the chat. And please feel free to live live tweet, I was going to say, I think it's live X these days, isn't it? Um, if, you're, if you use social media, feel free to share your comments through the session using the handles at chppc underscore IHR and at OCMCH Brooks, if that's your thing, I'll drop those handles into the chat. So we've got a, a wonderful panel this evening, quite a big panel because it's such a multifaceted project. So I'm going to introduce everyone in one go, but then you'll hear from everyone individually. So it'll make a bit more sense. 
So first of all, we have with us Daniel Reed, Peter Forsyth and Thomas Dobson from the Oxford Centre for Methodism and Church History. You've heard a little bit about the, the, the mission and the activities of that centre and its close relationship to the Smetham archive. We have Lizzie Barrett, who's an assistant collections manager at the British Museum, and she was a graduate intern on the project. Sarah Middleton is an independent researcher and creative practitioner who has developed learning material during the course of the project. And finally, my own colleague, Ruth Slatter, who's a, a lecturer here in our Centre for the History of People, Place and Community, whose research is specifically focused on what Smetham's creative practice reveals about Smetham's everyday lived experiences on the outskirts of 19th century London. So I'm going to hand over, I think, to you to start with, Ruth, is that right? That's so I'll nice. let you set up your screen share and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Catherine, and thank you to everybody um, for coming this evening. Um, this project has been a long time in the making and it is wonderful to be able to share it um, with people. So I'm going to top and tail um, this evening's uh, um, seminar, but I'm going to introduce each of my colleagues kind of along the way. So to begin, James Smetham was a Victorian artist and Methodist whose artistic outputs included large portraits and commissions, small postage stamp size square sketches, poems and much more. Um, and in these artistic outputs, he reflected on his personal life, mental well-being, religious beliefs and spiritual experiences. Since his death, Smetham has been the subject of several biographies. Some written by and primary for um, Methodists have presented him as an inspirational man of faith whose creative outputs were motivated by and facilitated worship. In contrast, others have studied him as a peripheral member of the pre-Raphaelite artistic community and have focused on his unproductive forays into the 19th century art market. However, Smetham and his creative outputs have otherwise been largely overlooked, and there has been little attempt to approach his creative work as part of discussions about broader themes or histories. This began to change seven or eight years ago. Um, in 2016, I was involved with a community history project associated with the rebuilding of Stoke Newington High Street Methodist Church in North London, where Smetham was a member for much of his later life. So working with um, Smetham's art in this context, and you can see a couple of his very small pieces of work on the wall there, um, I became aware of the strength of his work to reflect on his own personal um, faith and spiritual experiences and how they informed his lived experiences of um, London. At a very similar time um, in 2017, uh, Peter, who will be speaking to us later, um, after many, many years of engaging with Smetham's art as part of the um, Oxford Centre's collection, um, published this paper, which was um, the first explicit call uh, for um, Smetham art and his life to be approached as an interesting case study for reflecting on the relationships between creativity and spirituality. So in response in 2019, the Oxford Centre for Methodism and Church History brought together a team of um, archivists, creative practitioners, curators and researchers, many of whom are here with us this evening, to reconsider Smetham's creative outputs and work towards a series of activities um, that would coincide with the bicentenary of Smetham's birth in 2021. Now, as you can imagine, um, this initial timeline was significantly affected by the COVID-19 pandemic, but the pandemic in this instance um, was ultimately very beneficial for this project, giving it dimensions that wouldn't have been possible um, without the time, budget and online formats that lockdown um, opened up. So this project's diverse team um, and with all of our different aims and objectives has meant that at some times this project has felt very diverse and, and they're going in lots of different directions. Um, but throughout we have shared um, several overarching aims and engaged in four interlinked work packages. So firstly, um, the project aimed to raise the profile of James Smetham and the Smetham Collection at Oxford Brooks. Um, this has been achieved through the work to reappraise Smetham's biography and improve access to Smetham's um, creative outputs. Secondly, this project has aimed to engage in explorations of Smetham's creative practices beyond constructing his life history 
or positioning him as a postscript to the pre-Raphaelite um, art. This has been achieved again through work to reappraise his biography and reassess his art, um, partly made possible through a significant conservation project. Um, thirdly, this project has more specifically aimed to use Smetham's art to explore the intersections between the themes of creativity, Christian, specifically non-conformist, faith and mental well-being. And this has been achieved through archival research, public engagement, creative um, interactions with Smetham's work and community co-production. And finally, this project has aimed to explore how Smetham's creative practices can be used to gain insights into people's everyday lived experiences in the very outskirts of 19th century London and non-conformity in 19th century Britain more generally. And again, this has largely been a kind of archival public engagement focused aspect of the project. So although this project has never been funded by one large grant, each of these interrelated um, bits of work have received small pieces of funding along the way. So while this has made the project precarious at times, it has also given us the freedom to allow the project to evolve organically and respond to the developing interests of the group and our external partners. So now I'm gonna hand over to my colleague, Peter. Peter, you may need to unmute yourself. So it looks as though you are unmuted, Peter, but we can't hear anything at the moment. Perhaps, Daniel, would you like to start um, going through this section? And then if Peter needs to leave and come back in, he can. Yes, that's fine. We'll just um, adapt as we go, hopefully. Yes. Um, I'm Sophia. I'm, I'm Daniel Reed. Um, I'm public engagement manager and a research fellow at the Oxford Centre. And my uh, engagement with Smetham coincided with... Um, the beginning of my employment at the at the centre. That's where I first met Smetham and became involved with this bicentenary project. So a little bit of biographical and historical background to Smetham himself. He was born in Yorkshire in 1821, and he spent his early years training as an architect and portrait painter. Then in 1843, he entered the Royal Academy of Arts as a probationer. Never successfully appointed as a student of the RA, from 1851 to 78, he was the drawing master at Westminster College, a Methodist educational institution for the preparation of Methodist teachers. Simultaneously, Smetham, largely unsuccessfully, submitted paintings to the Royal Academy and other regional art academies. He was a prolific creator of smaller paintings and etchings, was commissioned to make paintings and portraits for various Methodist clients, wrote poetry, published critical reflections on the work of William Blake, and compulsively drew and sketched in his diaries and journals for his own personal benefit. Referred to as, as squarings, these small, often not geometrically square, sketches are perhaps the most idiosyncratic aspect of Smetham's creative outputs. He variously used them to capture diary-like reflections on his everyday life, his theological and personal interpretations of the Bible, and philosophical considerations of historical figures and concepts. Now, a brief glance at Smetham's paintings reveal his stylistic association with the contemporary pre-Raphaelite pre community. He shared with them a belief in the interdisciplinary approach to art and literature and an emotional intensity in his approach to artistic creation. And Smetham's often mystical and romantic style and choice of subject matter effectively demonstrated in paintings such as The Rose of Dawn and That Beadsman Old. Oh, my... I'm so sorry, Daniel. I was just waiting for a, a break. I'm so sorry. Uh, Peter is back in the room, so I just wanted to check whether um, whether it's time to to bring him back in, or just just to check whether we will be able to hear you, Peter, or whether we carry on as we are. Thank you, Daniel, for picking this up. No problem. So, Peter, we know you're with us in spirit. <laughs> um, hopefully, we'll find a way to hear from you later. And, and thank you so much, Daniel. I'll, I'll hand back to you. Thanks. That's fine. Yes, I'll carry on. Um, however, Smetham and his artistic outputs never obtained the same notoriety or commercial success as his pre-Raphaelite networks. And Smetham's artistic career was both aided and hampered by his religious identity. Smetham was the son of a Wesleyan Methodist minister and was himself a devout 
lifelong Methodist. Founded in the 18th century by the Anglican priest John Wesley, Methodism gained its name due to its members' methodical approach to the ordinances of God. Worship, evangelism, communion, prayer, biblical study, and fasting. Initially a radical group within the Church of England, by the 19th century Methodism was an independent denomination and had fractured into multiple groups that placed differing emphases on the movement's original theological principles. The Wesleyan Church positioned itself as the, uh, the official inheritor of John Wesley's tradition. However, by the mid-19th century, it had disposed of much of the original movement's radical practices in preference for the status of an established church. Nevertheless, Wesleyans continued to take a disciplined approach to the ordinances of God and emphasised the importance of Christian fellowship and service. Now, within this context, Smetham's religious identity provided him with an established network for artistic commissions. Many of his earliest portraits were of members of the Wesleyan community. While in 1863, he was commissioned by the Methodist Conference to capture the moment a group of Maori from New Zealand visited Wesley's house in London. Smetham's personal faith also provided him with considerable creative motivation and subject matter. For example, between 1851 in 1871, he made visual reflections in small squares on all 31,000 plus verses in the 66 books of the Bible. However, Smetham's personal faith also distinguished him from his artistic networks. His religious and moral framework meant that he was often discomforted by the behaviour of the pre-Raphaelites and 19th century artistic circles more broadly. As a result, Smetham did not consistently uh, attend the events where his contemporaries developed and maintained the networks required for commercial artistic success. Smetham's artistic career was also disrupted by his poor mental health. Described variously as depression, a state of darkness, a lowered tone, Smetham's ill health resulted in months of agoraphobia where he could not leave the house and periods where he was unable to create anything. As a result, while Smetham, lived, while Smetham lived in Chelsea and Pimlico when he first moved to London, in 1856 his mental fragility caused him to leave the noise and busyness of central London and move to Stoke Newington on the northern outskirts of the mid-19th century city. Here, as you can see in these photographs and illustration from Smethers' letters, he found a quiet, calm and almost rural environment that afforded him a conducive working atmosphere and he became a, a member of the local Wesleyan community there who supported him and his family. However, as Smetham frequently noted in his letters and journals, living in Stoke Newington separated him from his artistic networks and the central London art market. While Smetham's mental health went through periods of deterioration and improvement throughout his adult life, from the late 1870s, he entered a prolonged period of mental instability. During this time, he was confined to care homes and asylums, including the Hydro Clinic in Great Malvern, where Smetham was treated in 1878-9. Unfortunately, Smetham's condition became progressively worse until he was unable to paint, draw, write, or communicate in any meaningful way, suggesting that he may have been suffering with what would now be diagnosed as Alzheimer's disease before he eventually died, age 68, in 1889. And I'll pass over to Lizzie now. Okay, hello, I'm Lizzie Barrett and I worked as a graduate research fellow on the Smetham Project from 2020 to 2021. Um, and I work as an assistant collection manager as in the Pits and Drawings Department at the British Museum that continue to think about Smetham with the aim to do some more focused work on his output again soon. So one of the key aims of this project was to, to return to this, to this life story, which Daniel has just summarised, and reconsider it in light of the project's broader interests in the intersections between faith, creativity, and mental well-being, and the impact of individual faith on people's everyday experiences of place. To achieve this, we initially compiled two online exhibitions, one serving as an introduction to Smethen's biography and artistic output, and the other a timeline outlining in more detail some of the key moments in Smetham's early life. Artworks, poetry, extracts from personal letters and squarings were interweaved throughout both to provide a holistic view of the artist. This aimed to provide footholds for new viewers by contextualising Smetham's art with the within the contemporary Victorian art scene without merely depicting him as a footnote to the pre-Raphaelites. Instead, we aimed to depict Smetham on his own terms, foregrounding his emotional responses and their connections to his artistic practices. Um, 
So most notably, we drew on Smetham's biographical letters to the 19th century art critic, John Ruskin, where he reflected on a series of emotional moments and their deep and long-lasting effects on his artistic sensibilities and ambitions. For example, in one passage, he described the impact of the Yorkshire countryside on his emotions as a very small child. He writes, my first awakening to consciousness, as far as I can remember, was in a valley in Yorkshire, outside the garden gate of my father's house, when, at the age of two years, I have a distant remembrance of the ecstasy with which I regarded the distant blueness of the hills and saw, saw the laurels shake in the wind and felt it lift my hair. While in another, he reflected with notable vulnerability on the impact of his eldest brother's untimely death in 1842 and the effect this had on his mental health and ability to engage in creative practice. So again, he writes, the death of my brother cast a great shade over my wild dreams and extravagant ambitions. I did a great deal for his approbation, and when he had gone, my spirits followed him. A complete uproar and chaos of my inward life followed, and I fell into the slough of despond. The inclusion of these raw and emotive reflections within our reappraised biography of Smetham was inspired by, but also necessary to support, the broader thematic narratives constructed in other parts of this project. Without the detailed and systematic work that was constructed to create the bibliographically oriented online exhibitions, other aspects of our research would not have been possible. And now I will pass over to Tom. Yes, good evening. So I'm Tom Dobson, and as Ruth said, I have the privilege of caring for our collection at the centre. Um, the second key component of this project was raising awareness of Smetham's creative work and improving access to the Oxford Centre for Methodism and Church History's Smetham collection. This involved growing, recataloguing and conserving our collection, digitising and developing online platforms to promote aspects of this collection, and developing opportunities for the public to encounter, engage with and respond to Smetham's work. One of the most notable parts of this process was conserving and reframing some of the collection. Several pieces in this collection lacked a protective layer, had unstable frames or supports, or needed base level cleaning and paper conservation. With surplus funds in the centre's budget, as a result of the impact of COVID lockdowns on our activities, we were able to implement these conservation needs. By enabling us to look more closely at these items, this process provided us with a greater understanding of the material in our collection and has been fundamental in preparing the collection for increased public display and engagement. As a result of our conservation work, we've also been able to make more of our Smetham collection digitally accessible. We have added more items to the Centre's Flickr account, Art UK, which is a collection of artwork in the public ownership, and the Art UK shop. We've also placed this material at the heart of the new digital content we have developed including for the Archive and Record Association's Explore Your, Explore Your Archive Spotlight and our Bloomberg Connects app. These platforms have also allowed various audiences to encounter, engage with, and respond to Smetham's work for the first time. Beyond these digital spaces, we have invested in a range of in-person opportunities for audiences to encounter Smetham's art. For example, as part of Oxford Brooks's History of Art undergraduate programme, in 2021, 30 second and third year students on the curatorial practice module curated six works using pieces from our collections. Four of these exhibitions featured works from the Smetham collection and two of them featured his work solely. Through this process, students suggested new ways of thinking about pieces in the collection, positioning his art within thematic discussions around the environment and artistic depictions of the natural world, the evolution of women's rights throughout history and the development of etching as a process. In addition, in September of this year, we collectively opened the Pre-Raphaelite Outsider, James Smetham 1821-89 exhibition at Bewdley Museum in Worcestershire, which continues to be open daily until the 29th of October. The culmination of over four years of work on this project, this exhibition is the first occasion on which much of the centre's co collection has been on public display since the 1990s. It has therefore been the most significant aspect of this project's aim to raise awareness of Smetham's art, introduce him to new audiences, and provide them with opportunities to engage with his work. Visitors to the exhibition have explicitly commented on the quite remarkable 19th century portraits it includes, and how it sho showcases superb paintings and information about a little known 
artist. One visitor also described it as an unhurried exploration of an interesting artist. Handing now back to Daniel for more information about the project. Thank you, Tom. Um, well, from the beginning of this project, it was clear that one of the most effective and relevant ways to engage contemporary audiences with Smetham's art was by exploring the intersections between his creative practices, faith, and mental well being, in particular as a result of the team's pre existing relationships with faith communities. We were aware that these themes effectively spoke to and engage with contemporary debates about the best ways to acknowledge and respond to mental health within religious contexts. The pertinence of Smetham's art within these debates became increasingly apparent as we became aware of the complexity of those intersections between the issues in his life and work. At times, Smetham's creative practices and personal faith helped to improve his mental well-being. However, at others, the relationship between the two seemed to contribute more to its, its deterioration. This tension provided scope for us to subtly explore a difficult and highly personal issue. Ruth has discussed this in detail in relation to Smetham's squarings in her recent open access article in the Journal of Historical Geography. But in brief, we know from Smetham's papers that he used his creative practices to settle and control his mind in several ways. Firstly, he used artistic practice to reflect on his day and the places that he had visited. By doing so, he made a permanent record of relationships, events and activities that had been beneficial to his physical and mental health and used the protests of artistic creation to reduce the anxiety he may have felt about those experiences. Smetham also used creative practices to re record and develop ideas. This meant that he didn't have to hold on to lots of different thoughts and reflections in his mind. He could get them onto the page. Finally, Smetham also engaged in creative practice to give his life broader meaning and value by demonstrating to himself and to others the possibility of art being a spiritually worthy activity. Now, 19th century Methodists were expected, I'll read this quote, to be doing good by being in every kind merciful after their power as they have opportunity and doing good of every possible sort and as far as is possible to all men. Whilst most of his contemporaries in interpreted this as a call to teach, evangelize or engage in social action, Smetham felt that as his strongest talent was to create art, that was how he could most effectively serve others. However, 19th century Methodists were also at best ambiguous about art and creative practice. Many agreed with John Wesley's earlier proclamations that art was potentially dangerous, could tempt the mind and lure humans away from their commitment to God. Smetham himself referred to this passage from one of Wesley's sermons as serious words and worried that Wesley would have considered his artistic practice, quote, a lifelong mistake, all pampering the desire of the eye. So although many of Smetham's commissions came from his Wesleyan community, his artistic practices were rarely perceived to have spiritual value. Nevertheless, by the 1860s, Smetham was convinced that squaring was an effective way of using art to contribute to the spiritual growth of others. And by the 1870s, he was using his squares as biblical teaching aids. Initially, this gave Smetham significant joy. He'd found a way to use his artistic skills to fulfill a spiritual purpose. However, as time passed, this was replaced by an obsessive compulsion to engage in an activity that had the potential to give him spiritual value and meaning. By the mid-1870s, by the mid Sarah, his wife, had imposed a no-sketching rule on her husband to reduce his compulsive squaring practices. While by 1876, only months before his mental health deteriorated so badly that he was moved to an asylum, Smetham himself was aware of the mental strain associated with constantly drawing and squaring, and wrote to his friend William Davis that he yearned for time to rest and make nothing, not even his squares. Smetham consistently used art throughout his life to bring calm and order to his mind. However, within the context of 19th century Wesleyan expectations, Smetham's artistic practices became a symptom of a mental instability, which was at least partly informed by the theological incongruity of his artistic identity. 
As a result, whilst we have been engaging members of contemporary faith communities with Smetham and his art, we have intentionally created space for simultaneous practical engagement with Smetham's artistic practices and reflections on the effect of religious observance and institutions on individuals' mental well-being. And I'll hand over to Sarah to say a little bit more about this. Hello, I'm Sarah Middleton, an arts manager and tutor. I currently live in Cardiff, where I'm also a Methodist local preacher. To begin the process of engaging contemporary faith communities with Smetham's artistic outputs, in 2019, Ruth and I developed an art workshop around James Smetham's squares. This was for members of ArtServe, an ecumenical organisation describing itself as a movement of people discovering and reflecting God's creative gifts shared among us so that God is known more fully and lives are transformed. Our workshop introduced participants to Smetham's creative practices, particularly his squares and practice of squaring. We related these squares to 21st century mindfulness practices like those suggested by Matilda Tristram in My Year in Small Drawings, Notice, Draw, Appreciate. We invited participants to develop ways of recording their day or making in-depth visual responses to specific Bible verses. Responses to this session varied. For some, the process of making squares added little to their personal spiritual practices while others found it calming and fruitful. In the end, this workshop served as a mini pilot, demonstrating to us that others shared our curiosity about this little known artist, his Methodism, and his struggles with his mental well being. So I proposed a short online course, came to be known as Lifted, to explore art faith and mental well-being through the lives and creative outputs of five artists. James Smetham, who was the focal point, Unity Spencer, Eularia Clark, the First World War artist David Jones, and Vincent van Gogh. I tested this idea through a short course at my local Methodist church in Cardiff, and despite the constraints of the ensuing lockdown, a small group of members consistently engaged with the course, one reporting that by the end, she was smitten by Smetham. This pilot was then developed into an online Lent course in 2021. You see the poster here. And this was a collaboration between the Oxford Center for Methodism and Church History and Wesley House Cambridge with development funds from the Gibbs Family Trust. The course att attracted 18 students, ranging from UK Methodist presbyters, deacons and local preachers, to members of other churches, and those with personal interest as far afield as the USA. It received very positive feedback and students made creative, moving and very insightful responses to Smetham's art, particularly his painting, The Rose of Dawn. For example, one student wrote, maybe his mental health was affected by something else. He lived in a time of empire, of missionary zeal and possibly excess, with the justifying of the expansion of the British Empire for the sake of Christian evangelism and the godly improvement of those living in the dark continent. Maybe as a sensitive and creative soul searching for the light, Smetham was clambering to the top of that particular hill, away from darkness below. It was a time of light and dark in the world as in the imagination. And the Impressionists and Pre-Raphaelites played in the light. All this may have been too much for Smetham. Maybe he saw something others could not see in all the glory of that time. 
maybe. Uh, we, we look at another poem that was written by one of the students um, who described it as her brief attempt to capture her feelings as she stood in the place of the figure in the painting and hoped that God would continue to call and guide her. And it's there on the screen. And another shared her engagement with Smetham's squaring practice, comparing it with cartoon strips. Each of these student contributions and more have informed how our project has conceptualized and responded to Smetham and his art. In addition, the lifted course raised an important practical issue. In the feedback, at the end of the course, one student suggested that it may be appropriate to have a course chaplain, given the course's content contains a lot of mental health descriptions and there is a well-being element to the course aims. This was something I had become acutely aware of when running the course and took steps to mitigate by reaching out for support from the partner organisations through whom it was run. Subsequently, this comment has informed three key reflections and action points, which have broad implications for anyone engaging contemporary communities in the co-producing of histories associated with mental well-being. First, all subsequent activities we have run have been prefaced by a trigger warning. This has highlighted that the issue of mental ill health will be raised specifically in relation to the connections between mental well-being and religious faith. Secondly, as a team, we have committed to ensuring that all the activities we run will be supported by two people. This ensures that no one is on their own if participants disclose mental health problems or concerns. Finally, we have been very careful about the language we have used in advertising material or session descriptions. We've ensured that there is now no implication that the sessions we run have therapeutic potential. Instead, we emphasize how we will be introducing people to an artist and his practice and are interested in people's response to him, Smetham, his story and his work. Eventually, we would like to explore the therapeutic potential of Smetham's art, but to make this possible, we need to develop a productive collaboration with professional art therapists who have the necessary skills to develop appropriate activities and respond to their impact. These reflections and action points directly informed a second art serve session, which Peter and I ran in 2022. And also the interactive art workshop that Ruth and I will be running online this Saturday morning. And which you're all welcome to join in with. Now I hand back to Ruth. Thank you, um, Sarah. So these interactions and collaborations with members of contemporary faith communities have directly informed our thinking about the fourth and final aim of the project, which was exploring how Smetham's creative outputs can be used as sources of information about the impact of personal faith and spiritual encounter on individuals' everyday lived experiences in 19th century Britain. This part of the project um, is grounded in my more general interest in individuals' everyday experiences of religion, faith and spirituality in the past. After engaging with Smetham's art during the Stoke Newington um, Community History Project I mentioned earlier, and which you can see a photograph of the exhibition from here, I um, successfully applied for a small research grant from the Royal Geographical Society to explore Smetham's visual creations and what they revealed about his everyday experiences of Methodism in Stoke Newington. As a result of this research, I concluded that Smetham's creative outputs were rarely accurate representations of Stoke Newington, but they did provide important insights into his lived experiences of this area. 
principally how it affected his senses, emotions and mental well-being, how his, how, how his experiences of this space were fundamentally informed by the people he engaged with in the area and how his experiences of this as a physical um, material space imperceptibly merged with his experiences of a parallel spiritual realm. Firstly, Smetham's art and papers provide fantastic insights into how Stoke Newington affected his senses, emotions and mental well-being. In a letter in 1859, he explained how he had begun to paint in his garden in Stoke Newington and how this alfresco studio had improved his health and sparked his creativity. He wrote, it is the best studio in the world more peaceful, more healthy, more ennobling than any conceivable studio indoors. The weeping ash sways to the sway of thought. The fragrance of stock mingles with the odour of emotion. The voices of children under the mulberry and apple trees in adjoining gardens flit across the path of working trains of ideas. Life seems more sweet and simple. Work progresses. And if I were not fighting like a madman round a British square to get myself an opening into the market of art, my life would be an ideal one. Written three years after Smetham moved to Stoke Newington, this passage demonstrates how the area's atmosphere had had the desired effect on his mental well-being and provided him with the conditions he required to engage in productive artistic creation. In contrast, on the 26th of December 1871, he mused on the muddying impact of the winter weather in Stoke Newington on his brain and creative practice. December 26 has been one of those damp, raw, half foggy days which seem to bring the art faculty down to its lowest point. One of the penalties of this art faculty is its power of catching chameleon-like the colour of all around it. The thoughts seem to become muddy like a crossing sweeper's broom, or they cower and shiver and frown like the crossing sweeper himself. This, pa this passage is particularly interesting because it shows Smetham connecting his artistic temperament and his mental instability. It therefore suggests that while he appreciated how his art faculty, as he referred to it, allowed him to engage more deeply with his environment, he also believed that this was this um, that he he was particularly acutely affected by his environmental um, context because of his artistic temperament. Aware of these reflections, it is perhaps no surprise that Smetham effectively captured the affect of place in various aspects of his creative outputs. As Lizzie explained in the Rose of Dawn online exhibition, in his poem, A Thought of God from the 1860s, Smetham paid almost painfully attention to light, movement, rhythm and sound to evoke the sights, sounds and smells of the English countryside. But Smethen's sense of and response to place, particularly Stoke Newington, were not only informed by how the environment affected his body, mind and spirit, but also the impact of people in place. Smetham's relationships with his Methodist community caused him to have conflicted perceptions and experiences of Stoke Newington. On the one hand, he often reflected on how the area's Methodist community contributed to the peace and calm he associated with the area. In 1875, he described how yesterday was a day of furious conflict. However, the class was its balm and bay. There is something incommunicable in this communion. All feel it while under its spell, and it leaves for some time after its odour and glow upon the soul. So classes were a specifically a Methodist midweek small group meeting where individuals met to encourage each other in faith and keep each other spiritually accountable. Smetham was a member of Wesleyan classes throughout his adult life and led classes in Stoke Newington from 1861 to the late 1870s. This reflection on the effect of these meetings demonstrates how his Stoke Newington Methodist community was a balm to his soul, to the point of making it glow. However, Smetham also often felt isolated within his local Methodist community because, as Daniel has already explained, they rarely appreciated his artistic practices. 
On one occasion, Smetham wrote that the art side of his nature was so remote from the lived experiences and practices of his contemporaries that it was as if he were an Ojibwe, a 19th century word for a Native American. The combination of this creative isolation and the structured timetable of Methodist life in Stoke Newington not only made Smetham feel lonely, but also stifled his creative mind. In 1873, he wrote, I am isolated here in Stoke Newington. My Methodist ties are so numerous and close that they fasten me down, not only as to time and place, but fill me necessarily with a mental emotion quite averse to the free and open interest of the studios and the collateral influences of the critical press. My social life is in fact sternly dictated by Methodist and among Methodists. There is almost everything to deaden my art mind. Ultimately, unable to return to central London due to the impact of its environment on his mental well-being, Smetham did find ways to embrace the impact of Stoke Newington Methodist community and effectively mobilise it to facilitate his artistic practice. For example, he reflected on how his Methodist routine in Stoke Newington fostered a cooler temperament, more blunt sensibilities, a less open way of speaking, which meant that while normally I catch fire too readily and consume too fast and with more exhausting heat, I am now better as it is, feel better, do better, make fewer blunders, betray myself less often. Nevertheless, Smetham visually reflected on the stifling and controlling nature of his Methodist relationships in the orrery of personal responsibility, a diagram in which he spatially conceptualized and prioritized his relationships. Sarah and I have recently made a video specifically focused on this orrery, but for now it is sufficient to say that Smetham used this concentric circles to organize his relationships and position the most valuable to him closest to him. In this way, he can created a conceptual place which was literally constructed from his social, professional and spiritual connections and his strength of his associations with them. And this simultaneously demonstrates the emotional weight Smetham associated with human relationships and the extent to which his experiences of place were informed by these relationships. Finally, and has hopefully already become um, clear during the course of this seminar, Smetham's everyday experiences of Stoke Newington and place more generally merge with his experiences of a spiritual realm. The intersections between Smetham's everyday and spiritual encounters are most strikingly demonstrated within his squaring journals, where he simultaneously squared for everyday and spiritual purposes. However, more interestingly than this, Smetham often used the process of squaring to amplify the everyday and transform it into a spiritual event or encounter. He described how squaring allowed him to express his ideas and experiences in a much more efficient form, and that by turning good things into acts of praise and taking joy in it, squaring transformed the mundane into something divinely musical. Um, that's the word that he used. For example, Smetham often discussed the physical discomfort he associated with the noise, smells and busyness of visiting central London, which he had to do regularly in order to work at Westminster College. However, by squaring these journals, um, he regulated his memories, reduced London's assault on his senses and began to place greater emphasis on how thankful he was for the people he had seen or activities he had engaged in while visiting central London. So the process of squaring allowed Smetham to transform his mundane, everyday experiences into divine expressions of praise. None of these insights into Smetham's perceptions and experiences of place would have been possible had this research not been um, positioned within a broader co-produced exploration of Smetham and his creative outputs. Indeed, the real strength and joy of this project has come from our collaborat collaborative working practice and commitment to engaging with contemporary faith communities. So there are many um, future potentials for this project, but we're going to conclude now and wrap this up 
um, and perhaps we can discuss these ongoing trajectories during the following questions and comments. Thank you.